أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم. السلام عليكم سيسترز and brothers. Please subscribe to my channel for more awesome Islamic video. <laughs> Inshallah. Would you please state your name and occupation, then state your question. I'm Sakina De Souza, and uh, I'm a Catholic. She's Catholic. I believe okay. uh, Brother Yusuf was a Catholic before. I would like to ask him the simple question. He was brought up like a Catholic, but what made him change? Doesn't he believe that the Messiah is true, or did he ever feel that the uh, religion, Catholic religion, has not brought up any Messiah and the Bible is false? I would like to just know what that means because he said he was a Catholic before and now he has become a Muslim. What made you change? What was the wow. storyline before? Doesn't he believe that there is a Messiah? Or the Messiah had come, saved us, died on the cross. Thank you very much for a good question. Yeah, good question. I hate to disappoint you, but I wasn't a Catholic. But I was with a Catholic priest the night that he accepted Islam. And I asked him these questions you asked me. Because after all, I was still a Christian, a preacher in Christianity, and I wanted to know why my best friend, a Catholic priest, had converted. That's a pretty weird thing. A Catholic priest is not like a regular preacher in the Protestant religion. A Catholic priest has given up his, given up everything. He's given up his life to be a Catholic priest. When he enters into this realm, he's basically given away everything. He can't have a wife, he can't have children, obviously no grandchildren. He has no home, he just lives in a rectory or wherever they give him a place to stay. And he's sent wherever they tell him to go, do whatever he's told to do, and that's it. And he mm. cannot disobey the Pope, otherwise they can kick him out of the religion. And if they do, he's excommunicated wow. and he goes to hell forever. So how would a person like this want to become one of those Muslim terrorists? That's what I wanted to know. Mm. He explained in a very few beautiful words something that I came to learn for myself. He said that he was sincerely in the Catholic religion because he believed in God. That he had studied, his degree was in theology, and a part of the teaching that they as priests have is to study Islam. Every priest is forced to study Islam. Now you may not know that, but you can ask your priest and he'll confirm it. And when you study Islam, even when Islam is taught to you by somebody who hates Islam, as long as they don't corrupt it too far, you can still see the truth in Islam. A classical example happened to me just recently when I was in Saudi Arabia. A friend of mine, very old copy of one of the first Qurans ever translated to English by George Sale. George Sale hated Islam, he hated the Muslims, but when he translated the Quran to English, he was true he was true to the text of the words. Although maybe not getting all the meaning, he certainly was true to the text of the words. I was shocked when I read it. Have you seen it? You know what I'm talking about. Amazing. And listen to this. George Bernard Shaw, for instance, is one of many, a long list of people who read this and realized the truth of Islam. When people see the truth of Islam, it can change them if they want to be guided. If they want the truth, it can change them. You might think, I'm a Catholic, I'll never be anything but a Catholic. But I'm going to ask you a question, and I want you to be honest. This is not for you to you know, start a debate, but just be honest. Was Jesus a Catholic? And it's not open to debate, so there's no point in opening that up, because you know and I know he wasn't. The Catholic Church was in business about 300 years before Jesus was born. It's on their website. Don't go like this. It's on their website. That's where I took it from. The Catholic Church was really started in Rome by Alexander the Great. Do you know what the word Catholic means? Universal. It means universal. It was the universal church for the Roman Empire. If you didn't join it, you could not be a Roman citizen. And it was opposed to the teachings of Judaism and mm -hmm. opposed to the teachings of the early Christians 
for more than 200 and some years. And they were diametrically opposed to each other to the extent that it was the Romans killing the early Christians. Now, if you understand that and you go to their website and read, they didn't even take over Christianity until the year 325 AD. And when they did, they changed a lot of things. Again, referring to their own website. But if you want to check it in Brand Britannica or Americana or grow your encyclopedias, go ahead and read about the Catholic Church. When in August of 325 AD at the Nicaea Council, they took over. First thing they said was, let's change the date of the birth of Jesus to be the same date as that of Mithras, which was the god one of the gods worshipped there, and also the sun god's birthday was the same day, December the 25th, believing it to be the shortest day of the year. And Constantine was a sun worshipper of Saul Invictus. Go to the website, read it for yourself. There are a lot of points, but not the least of which, even today, if you go in any Catholic church, and I have, you'll see so many portraits and statues and idols and images throughout the whole place. That for the one who's never experienced that, for a Muslim who knows about these images, he'll be like, whoa, I was below. Whoa, what's this? <laughs> the first time I walked in a Catholic church, I was about 10 years old. I was shocked. I was shocked at the idols and statues everywhere because in the Protestant religion, we were brought up to believe that the second commandment was just as important as, as the first commandment. Yeah. The first commandment in no the Bible idols. in Exodus is the same as the first commandment in the book of Deuteronomy. It says, I'm the Lord your God that brought you out of the land of Egypt in the house of bondage. You know no other God beside me. Beside me, there's no other gods. Thou shalt not have any other no gods God. beside me. How many in this room agree with that commandment? Raise your hand. You notice the Muslims are raising their hand. Because it means, Ashadu la ilaha illallah. That's the first commandment for us as well. The second mm -hmm. commandment you have clearly says, Thou shalt now make any idol, any idol. graven image of anything or that creeps upon the system. earth, swims in mm -hmm. the sea beneath, or flies in the air above. And I was sitting in a church one time, sitting there in the morning service, watching, you know, the preacher talk. And, you know, they go on and on and on. And sometimes you lose your train of thought. I was looking. Whoa! On the front of the podium, there was a fish. A fish. For the symbol, make you fishers of men. They had a fish. I said, whoa. Then I looked up above his head at the big stained glass window and it had a dove. And he had the, the olive branch in his mouth. The dove is flying, the bird, you know. I said, whoa. And then I look over here and there's a cross with a man hanging on it. And I said, wow, they didn't miss a single one. They got them all. Something walking on the earth. Something swimming in the sea beneath something flying in the air above. So look at these two things. Clearly the first two of the Ten Commandments, bang, bang, boom. Because if you said God is more than one, mm -hmm. where did you get it from? When Jesus is talking to his own companions and they ask him, what's the greatest commandment? Mark 12, 29. Clear. The greatest commandment is to know, O Israel, the Lord your God is one, one God. And you have to love him with all your heart and all your mind and all your strength. And this is no different from what Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu is saying the same thing to his people. Same thing I mentioned in the lecture. This is certainly for us the same. So what you see is Muslims practicing the commandments and you see people claiming the commandments but practicing something else. And they, I have seen more converts from the Catholic Church than any other of the many sects of Christianity. Christianity. And especially mm. from the nuns, priests, and even an archbishop. And all of them are better than me. Those guys wow. and women that I see do this, they still sacrifice their whole life to get the true message of Islam, not only to you, but to Muslims as well, because we all need to know about it. But thanks for a great question. So why do bad things happen to good people? Why do bad things happen to good people? Tell us. And you say, well, how's that the beauty of Islam? The beauty of Islam is that it totally and completely explains to the point that 
you can become happy, not only with the understanding, but with whatever comes. Mm. Because it's, it's in the Quran that Allah explains your purpose. If you thought that your purpose of life was to hang around here and have a good time, waiting for a chance to get into paradise, Allah makes it clear that that's not the case. As a matter of fact, in chapter 29 of the Quran, the very beginning of it, Allah makes it very clear that if you come to this correct belief that there really is only one God, and the worship is really on for, for Him, then at that stage, you're going to be put into some really big testing. Because as he says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Alif Lam Mim, Ahasab al-Nas an Yudruko an Yakulu Amana. Do the human beings think they're going to be left alone just because they say we believe? Hmm. And that they won't be put into a big fitna as the ones before them were put into this big fitna to show who are the truthful and who are the liars. Huh? So you said, I believe. Okay, get ready. Because you now understand that it has to happen because it, this is a, a way for you to know if you really do believe. I know it happened to me personally, exactly like that. I came in, and a brother, Muslim brother, came to our home right after I did Shahada. And he said, I want to sit with your family. I want to talk to you guys and tell you what's going on. Because all of us had come to Islam at one time. Alhamdulillah. He said, but I want to explain to you. Some big testing is going to come to you. No, he said, we've already been tested. We understand. We know everything. <laughs> he said, you don't really understand. I said, we've been through a lot. You don't understand what it took for us to get to this point. And we had had some business difficulties. We had lost, you know, some material things along the way and was really thought we knew what he was talking about. Testing. Little did we know. We had no clue what was going to come next. It became unbelievable the things that kept happening and happening and happening between July, which is when we did Shahada, and January, January of the next year, it's, what is that, six months? Is that six months? Bad. What could happen in six months? Hmm. Well, I'll tell you how bad it was. From a guy that used to have, you know, membership in these major golf courses, I lived on a golf course, walk out my back door, I was on the 14th hole of the Masters in the country club I belonged to in Dallas. Had my own planes. Hmm. Okay? Homes with swimming pools. You get the, you get what it's like, right? Nice. Huh? <laughs> Luxury life. Six months later, I have an old school bus. That's all that's left out of all the inventory of all the vehicles I had. An old school bus. And <laughs> it caught on fire. And it was about to blow up with 40 gallons of gas in it. And I pulled out the fire extinguisher. I was going to try to put it out, and when I pushed the button, it went, Whoa. it was defective. I didn't know what I was going to do. I got a tow truck. I got it out. I threw a blanket over it. Got a tow truck, took it out to a junkyard. I was thinking, what happened? How could I be in such a shape, you know? Left the truck there and at this junkyard, 10 miles off of the main drag, the main road. And I asked the guy there to give me a ride back out to the road, you know, just give me a ride out to the road and I'll try to catch a truck or something and go back because, you know, got to get home, which was many miles away. Actually, I was in Oklahoma and I had to go back to Texas. He said, that's not included in the tow. Oh. I said, well, how much is it? He said, I don't feel like it. Just go out there and somebody will give you a ride. I said, go where? It's an old dirt road. He says, there it is. 
So I stood on the side of that dirt road and I was really thinking, what have I done wrong to be in this condition? A car went by, it was a lady in it. I didn't want to ride in there, you know, even think about that. Then another car came by, nothing. Then a small pickup, you know, a real small pickup came, had two guys already in it. The guy said, where are you going? I told him, up to the freeway, 10 miles. He said, okay, get in the back. There was no room to get in the front, get in the back. I said, he's got a lot of stuff. He said, just sit on the stuff, it doesn't matter. Bags, bags, you know. I got back in there, these big bags. I said, what's that smell? Uh, it's these bags, they smell really bad, you know. So they started driving, you know. It was freezing cold. It started hailing, you know, little pieces of ice hitting me, hitting me, hitting me. So I have to crouch down like this to get away from the ice but it puts my nose right by these bags. <laughs> what do you think was in oh, the bag? Manure. Fertilizer. Fertilizer, yeah. Really good fertilizer. It comes from Kanzir. Pig poop. <laughs> now here's yours truly, right? I'm used to wearing heart shafter and mark suits. I'm, well, and I'm here <laughs> hugging a bag of, <laughs> yeah, and I'm thinking, what is this? It was so cold, my eyebrows got ice in my eyebrows, you know, and when we finally got up to the road, I, I said, do you mind to take me just to the other side, because I need to go, he said, no, we're going this way. Otherwise, Americans are really nice. <laughs> I got out, you think. I got out, mm -hmm. they took off. And as I was walking under the bridge, I was thinking, Islam is the truth. Islam is correct. I can't find any flaw in it. I really spent six months really looking hard at a lot of the subjects that Islam teaches. It's absolutely true. There's no doubt. So what is wrong? What is wrong with me? What did I do? I had everything before I come to Islam. I get nothing. What is that all about? Is God mad at me? Maybe that's just it. I found the right way, but he's mad at me. Alhamdulillah, that wasn't true. Because you and I know if Allah is mad at somebody, they, they got a serious problem, not compared to that. Well, subhanAllah, I said, well, I, that's wrong. I shouldn't think like that. I went up the embankment, up to the main part of the freeway, tried to catch a ride. A big truck's going by. Pew, pew. And it was getting cold again, and I was thinking, how? How? All of a sudden, a red car came over the top of the hill. Like Lamborghini, you know what's Lamborghini? A real cool sports car comes over mm -hmm. the top and goes, I said, wow. Because, you know, back in the day, hey, that was your truly. Here he goes over the hill, and he stopped, and he started backing up. Now I'm thinking, uh, uh, why is he back? Who is this guy? He's going to back up. He don't want to pick this. I look terrible. Mm -hmm. And this guy's going to back up. He's probably going to run over me. Probably, you know. Or maybe something we used to do when we were kids, you know. You back up to somebody and they come running and try to get that. You know, say, you tired of walking? Yeah, run a while. I didn't really think it was going to be anything good, but the guy got back up to me, rolled down the window, and he said, excuse me, can you help me? I said, what do you need? He said, do you mind to ride with me because something's happened to me. I can't keep my eyes open. It's only 5 o'clock in the afternoon, but he said, it's just like my eyes keep shutting, and I've got to get up to Dallas, and it's a very long way. Do you feel like you could talk to me, keep me awake so that I can get there? I would really appreciate it. Let's see, I don't know. Do I want to get out of this nice cold weather into your nice warm car? Let me check my calendar and see if I'm busy. Turns out I've got an opening here. I'll get in the car. <laughs> I got in the car, shut the door, and I'm still thinking, it's brand new, by the way. You can smell the new. You like that new leather smell? You got in there and said, now what? This is, 
what's the Lord doing to me here? Hmm. We start going along, and the guy says, please talk to me. I really am falling asleep. Start telling me anything. I said, about what? He said, well, let's start with how you wind up on the side of the road and why you smell like that. <laughs> I said, there you go. <laughs> let's do that. <laughs> Let me take you back here. <laughs> you want to talk, I'll talk. I'll tell you everything I know. I guess we could teach the CIA how to get stuff out of people. Now just put them in the back of a pickup with a bunch of pig fertilizer. They'll tell you anything. But I went along with him, and I began explaining the events that led up to me being standing there, which started out about a year back when my father wanted to do business with a Muslim. And how I tried to convert the Muslim to become a Christian. Mm -hmm. How a Catholic priest got involved in the story. And before you know it, the Catholic priest accepted Islam. My wife and I accepted Islam. Then later my father accepting Islam. But then other things started happening. Our business down by Mexico went bad. And somebody ripped off all our stuff, stole our things. I had a brand new Suburban. It disappeared with the paperwork in it. And I couldn't trace it because I hadn't filed it yet. It was totally a, a strange thing. Many things I'm telling him this story as we're going along, telling him what happened, what happened. He's going, wow, wow, whoa, wow. Then we came up to a junction in the road. And this road that comes into Texas from Oklahoma splits. And one part goes to Fort Worth, Texas. The other part goes to Dallas. I need to go to Fort Worth. He needs to go to Dallas. There's a truck stop. I'll get out there. He said, do you mind? Really, I, he said, I, I, I just want to hear the end of this story. Do you mind if I just go ahead and take you to Fort Worth so I can hear the rest of it? Hmm. Again, I have to check my schedule, but it turns out there's this opening and we can go. And I'm still thinking, what well, is this real? And as we're going along and I tell him the rest of the story and he's going, man. And all that because you came to Islam. I said, well, I don't know what else to say. He said, that is beautiful. I said, excuse me? <laughs> <laughs> what, what part of the story did I miss while I was telling it? He said, because, he said, you know what? He said, I'm a reformed church of Latter-day Saints, Mormon. And he said, and really... I'm fed up with my religion. And what you told me about Islam, it sounds amazing. So all he really heard me talking about was the Tawheed, was the answers to the questions that Allah gives you. Is When you come to Islam, the answers are there. But the incidentals that take place in your life, well, those are things that happen in your life. So what? Well, the main thing is, you know there's a law. And you know everything comes from a law. It's all going back to a law. And you've got the real hard evidence there really is God. And that's one of the beauties of Islam. Your heart is in peace because you know it's all from a law. He said, so all of this is from a law. I said, well, yeah. He said, that's beautiful. How can I know more about this religion? Well, I said, you know, there's some guys I'm staying with right now. I, I didn't even have a house anymore. Didn't have any clothes anymore. And so I told him, we're staying at this house. Come on, let's go over here. And we got there, and the brothers weren't back yet. They were at the masjid, but they'd left food cooking. So the food was all on the stove. And when we went in, served him up the food. We sat there, enjoyed a meal together. He said, well, I really have to go. Do you have any pamphlets or anything about this religion? I said, I don't really know what to tell you. But I saw some things laying there from Whammy. You heard of the Nedwat al-Alamein al-Shabab al-Islamiyah. Well, that's my first exposure to those kind of pamphlets. So I gave him some of those. And he said, you know, I'm going to really look into this because this really sounds like something for me. And I sure do thank you. I really appreciate it. And by the way, wow. he was at least 60 miles out of the way from where he needed to be. But he brought me right to the house. And there was a meal waiting for me. 
a meal, hot meal, waiting for me. Now, I didn't know that was going to happen, did I? A few hours before, I was standing out in, in the snow, in the ice, huh? And now here I am in a nice warm house, got food to eat, and what a lovely ride I had. And maybe he made shahada, I don't know. But if he did, maybe Allah will even count that as me giving effort to somebody to get to Islam. Now, in this story I just told you, did you see any beauty there? Huh? Or did you just hear, oh, this guy had a hard day, and it was really a lot of problems, and blah, blah, blah. What if I had not been there? What if I had not been there? And the man fell asleep and had an accident and died and never got to Islam. What if? Now, that's not the color of Allah. This is the way Allah wanted it to happen. It happened according to his plan. I'm just showing you, though, if you change anything in Allah's plan, weird things would happen. Allah knows what's best. And if you said, well, somebody died, how could it get worse than that? Worse? They could have lived. Because maybe they died on the fitra. Maybe they died as a Muslim. Or maybe they died and because of their death, other people will get to Islam. Or at least other people won't leave Islam. You don't know and I don't know. It's up to him. Hmm. Isn't it? The non-believer is the one that has a problem. Muslims really don't have that problem. You get upset. You know, some my dad died, and, and he did die. But you know what? Because I was Muslim, I understood it. And I cried, by the way. But it wasn't like the kind of crying that it would have been when I was not Muslim. You know, oh, why my father? Oh, why this happened to me? No. It was crying like this. I was crying out of happiness that at least he became Muslim before he died. Crying out of happiness because I know, although I'll miss him for a while, we can be reunited in Jannah together. And crying also because I know that this is Qadr of Allah and all of us, we're going to come to this sometime. Hmm. And by the way, the Prophet Sallallahu Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, when his son died and he was holding him, he cried. They said, even you are crying? And he said, all of us, we have our moment of this. We have feelings, we're humans. So yes. You couldn't cry. Everything that you want to know about your life, life in general, or your life in particular, is in Islam. Do you like to know how you're created and what's going to be your ultimate end in this earth? Do you want to know? It's easy. Allah said in the Quran, the very first words he told you, Bismillah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Ikra bismi rabbika ladhi khalaq. Khalaq al-insana min alaqa. Here Allah is saying, and these are the first words revealed. Recite in the name of your Lord, the one who is the creator. Created the human beings from an alaqa. An alaqa is what? Today, you can ask anybody that's in embryology, and they'll tell you, yeah, it's that little tiny thing that you can't even see with your eye, but it clings to the wall of the uterus inside of the mother, and it forms a blood clot, and it's shaped like that little worm-looking thing or leech that they have down in South America. And by the way, all three of those things are alak, alak, alak. And Allah described it before people had microscopes, before people even knew that human beings didn't start out as little teeny people that just grew up big inside of their mother. And Allah described all the trimesters. Allah described all of the shape, being in shape and out of shape, like a chewed lump. All of the things that Allah speaks about of you being created are in the Quran. And then your final outcome, where you'll be. He tells you everything along the way, but the ultimate is, Kulu nafsin dayakatumot. Every soul will taste death. Yeah? Wow. What do you want to know? Do you want to know about the creation of Allah? And he tells you about the universe. Do you want to know about the earth? And he talks about the earth. And the sun and the moon, it's all there. Where? In the Quran, the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Well, how much proof do you need? 
What does it take for you to catch it? He's given you everything. There's the owner's manual, not only for the human being, but the entire universe. What do you want to know? What you need to know, it's there. It's there. But the most important thing of all is to know that you can communicate directly with him. And you do not need an intercessor. You don't need to go through a human being yeah. or an animal or a piece of wood or a statue. But you can use your heart and communicate directly with him anytime you want to. Isn't that a beauty of Islam? And the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him, he told us an amazing thing. Again, with this same thing, the same focus. Ajib. Amazing is the condition of the believer. Because only good happens to them. When anything good comes their way, they make shukr. Thank you to Allah. But any difficulty, any fitna, major calamity comes their way, they make sabr, which is to be persevering, steadfast, patient. And it's all good for them, he said. But only in the case of the believer. Only in the case of who? The believer. That's the beauty of Islam.